I don't think I'm going to take up the full amount of time today, so we can turn you loose to get back into this weather. But I uh, do have some information I want to share with you today about the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Unit. Uh, if you haven't heard about this project, you probably haven't been living in Juneau for, for, uh, for very long. The hospital board, uh, though they haven't been really public about it, has been discussing this project um, for a good decade, 10, 11 years. Uh, we've been discussing how we might do this, uh, making sure the need existed. So I'm going to go through some of our due diligence. Hopefully it will allow you to see sort of the scope of the project, the need for the project, and uh, other issues related to that. First of all, um, just a description of, of what exactly it is we're proposing uh, we need here. Uh, these facilities would provide evaluation and treatment of children with complicated mental illnesses. Uh, it provides an environment uh, for their physical and psychological needs to be met. It would include group and individual therapy areas, a schoolroom, uh, dining and kitchen facilities, open community spaces, and a locked seclusion room, and then, of course, inpatient rooms. The, uh, the number of beds needed in a unit like this is uh, really important to determine. The last thing the hospital ever wants to do is overbuild. Uh, we don't want to sink our money into bricks and mortar uh, for something that's not needed. So back in 2005, the hospital paid Diamond Healthcare to do an initial needs analysis. Um, that analysis in 2005 uh, showed a need for a 9 to 13 bed unit. In 2009, uh, we had that study updated, which confirmed uh, that range, uh, making it a little bit more definitive, saying we needed a 12-bed unit. Uh, earlier this year, we entered into a series of discussions and meetings with various uh, agencies, uh, both local and statewide. Uh, we went over the feasibility study, the analysis with them, uh, and just confirmed the need. Uh, we do have support from the state of Alaska agencies that we feel like are important to be supporting this project. Uh, our local agencies, after further clarification of the need and, and the patient population this would serve, are very supportive. And um, so we feel like we've sort of beaten the need to death and we have a really good handle on, on uh, the size of facility that's needed. So again, it's a confirmed need for 12 beds. The, the distribution of where the need exists for these beds. Six would serve the Southeast Alaska population. Uh, there is no other facility like this in Southeast Alaska. Um, four of those beds uh, would meet sort of overflow um, uh, needs. Well, I'll just summarize that and say six of those beds are basically for state needs that exist outside of Southeast. Uh, right now, uh, because there aren't enough beds in the state, patients are having to be sent out of state uh, for this type of service. We visited also, I might say, with um, some of the hospitals that are in Anchorage. Uh, those facilities are about as big as they want to be. They feel like if they get bigger, uh, it's not going to uh, be conducive to them being able to provide the kind of service they want to provide. So. Having a separate facility, one that's a little bit smaller, uh, to meet the overflow needs in the state um, has been confirmed and supported. A couple of statewide needs and priorities, the Bring the Kids Home initiative, which is um, well established now, uh, which documented, I believe, around five to 600 children from Alaska that were having to go out of state uh, for residential chemical dependency needs, um, detoxification, uh, needs. This initiative solves a, a small part of that problem. I'm not going to tell you it solves it all, but uh, this particular unit will be able to handle detoxification. So 10 to 14 day length of stay uh, for children in our state that need to be uh, go through detox services. What it will not do, it will not provide the three month to 12 month residential program. Uh, that particular need will still exist. At the hospital, we do not feel like we are uh, the provider that's equipped or has specialization in that area. That would be more of a JYS uh, if that facility, Juno Youth Services, if that facility were ever to be built here. Um, again, the focus on suicide prevention. Uh, we're not the only state uh, with this issue. Um, I came from Oklahoma, and 
Uh, I think it's a nationwide issue. It tends to be on the rise. We've got to do something to get this in check. Um, it's tragic. Um, the hospital I was at in Oklahoma, our, our uh, you know, uh, I saw our top ten suicide enter into our top ten list of uh, cause of death uh, while I was there. Um, so Alaska's not alone in this, but it is an issue we have to get a grip on, we have to get a handle on, and the governor is giving a special emphasis to that. Some conditions treated. I, I hope to have Dr. Poppenheim, who's our director of behavioral health uh, here today, but he had to, had to go out of town. These are just some of the disorders that we're going to be equipped to treat. Uh, schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder. You can read down the list. Um, and then we will also be able to, uh, uh, mild uh, mental retardation would not be an exclusion from the facility. So we would be equipped to handle patients with needs in that area as well. I uh, wish none of these problems existed, but um, for those suffering with these things, we really, um, we really need to, to do something to provide care. Uh, this is a, a, a site plan. The hospital uh, just, just recently completed some master facility planning, uh, a, full, a full master facility plan. The last one we had was done a decade ago, and you see what you see at the hospital campus today is a fruition of that plan. Uh, so we felt like it was time to, to lay something else out for the next 15 to 20 years so we sort of would understand how our campus was going to develop. Uh, and you see the light, uh, it's very, very small. I'm going to point to it up here so you can see it. That is the proposed location for this child and adolescent mental health unit uh, facility. The projected cost is around 23 million. Uh, these spaces have to be specialized. There's a lot of building regs and requirements that have to be met uh, when these kind of facilities are built. It's 16,532 square feet. The very, very, very earliest we could break ground on this would be uh, 2000, late 2012. More than likely, uh, it would be pushed into 2013. And we're not naming the project by its year. We found out with Project 2005 that was a mistake because I don't think we finished it till 2009. <laughs> this is just an idea. It's just very high level um, space planning uh, for the facility. It shows the 12 bed unit, sort of the education dining uh, area. We have to have a gym by law to operate a facility like this. The children need room to move around, run, play. Um, need to have education spaces available. You see it uh, on the second level, some shell space. We, uh, in 2009, when we revisited this project, things got out of hand. And we, uh, we ended up looking at building a three-story building which would house the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Unit. We looked at putting a replacement facility for Rainforest Recovery Center in there. And we looked at putting our psychiatrist offices in there. So. We ended up with this 40-some million dollar project, which was not feasible. And uh, I said at that point, look, let's go back. Why did we start discussing this? There is a need in this community that we have to meet. So uh, let's, let's just simplify it. Let's look at what we have to do to get this particular service in place. So there is a little bit of shelled space uh, on that second level. Uh, this building would be built. The, part of the reason for the shelled space is, is the ceiling heights for the gym, for the kids to be able to do a few things in there. It also pushes the building up a level so that we can tie it in with a skywalk over to our adult mental health unit and provide some staffing efficiencies and, and uh, other efficiencies. Okay, funding sources. Uh, this is really, really important. The first one you see on there is secure. The other two are my wishful thinking, okay? Um, the, the hospital has reserved uh, $5 million last year. We're in the process of reserving $5 million this year uh, just out of our, our operating uh, cash. Uh, so we will have $10 million uh, by June 31st to put towards this project. We are hopeful, and, and there is a long, long, long line of people uh, looking at that sales tax including people, the people who want it put back in their pocket and don't want it, you know, don't want to be taxed. I think we're all tired of taxation, but this, uh, this is, again, wishful thinking. The Assembly has a, a lot of projects on the docket, a lot of people looking at that sales tax money as a potential revenue source. 
Uh, the assembly will need to prioritize those issues. They'll need to figure out um, what, if any, of those projects they want to try to fund from the sales tax. So that one's a big question mark. Uh, the other thing, after it's vetted by the assembly, as you know, that sales tax needs to be approved by a vote of the people. So a couple of uh, vetting screens in there. Uh, and then my, my, my third piece of this, which is wishful thinking, but it would make a lot of sense given the mental health trust and some other, uh, other uh, state priorities, that at least three million of that come from state sources. The economic impact, I am speaking to the chamber. Um, I think this way anyway, but the economic impact is uh, 18 new jobs, an additional 1.5 million in annual payroll that comes into this community and gets circulated. The financial pro formas project a self-sustaining service. We are not doing this project because it produces the biggest return on investment. It does not. Uh, the, the projected net income is around $700,000 per year off of a net revenue of about $7.5 million. So yeah, it projects a, a fairly uh, healthy net margin. We can self-sustain it. We're looking at it more from the standpoint of a long-term break-even service, and the reason I say that is with health care reform and Medicaid funding no longer coming at the level it has been from the federal government, the state is under a lot of pressure to do something about the oncoming onslaught of Medicaid costs. And this facility is primarily funded uh, in a large majority by Medicaid recipients. So we don't, we don't think the, the levels of reimbursement we're receiving today are going to drop off dramatically because our particular states are uh, in a pretty good position, but there is going to be downward pressure. Um, so again, we're looking at it. Can we do it, keep it at break even? Can it be self-sustaining? We think it can, um, but definitely not doing it because of the net margin. This is a community need. Okay, that's off of the Child, child and Adolescent Mental Health Unit. Uh, I've got two little slides I want to show you, and then I'll just open it up for questions. Uh, one thing I, I am so pleased and proud to communicate is Bartlett's performance on uh, measures of quality. Uh, clinical quality has been uh, our priority. Uh, we've put special emphasis on it in the last four years. This documents our performance over the last four years uh, in four areas, myocardial infarction, heart failure, pneumonia, and surgical care. And the federal government has essentially said there are best practices that should be done every time on every patient. And you can see where we were performing uh, back in, I think, 2007, 2008. And we've made a steady climb. The last two years, your hospital has been um, honored by the um, uh, National Quality Achievement uh, Foundation uh, both receiving their highest honor, which is the National Quality Award, and then this last year, the Commitment to Quality Award. We're one of only four hospitals in the state uh, to receive that, and two years running, uh, I think we're showing a track record uh, that we're committed, and we're going to do what it takes to make our quality uh, the very best uh, in Alaska, and regionally, and eventually nationally. Uh, HCAPS is a fancy word for patient satisfaction questions um, that the federal government is monitoring. They're comparing uh, hospital to hospital on these questions. Um, you can see our performance is climbing up uh, steadily, again, over the last few years. Very, very difficult. We monitor this and scrutinize it at every level. Uh, there are de there's detailed questions. There's correlation coefficients. We know which questions are most important to patients' uh, level of satisfaction. We drill down, we have meetings with department managers every month to go over the questions they're working on. We're committed to pushing this up and up and up. So you can see um, you know, our scores uh, in these areas range between 60 and 85 percent, uh, whereas before they were ranging between about 45, I believe, and 70 percent. So really important that we keep our eye on this uh, target. So with that, I'm just going to open it up for questions. Um, there'll be internet access, I'm assuming, uh, which would provide the library resources. The education component of this 
Um, you know, we, we're still trying to determine how that would be, how that would function. Likely, there'll need to be an on-site tutor from time to time, but a lot of it can be internet-based. Uh, I think the library services would function that way as well. And to answer your other question, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get this completely right, but I believe there are about uh, 40 beds statewide dedicated to child and adolescent needs. You mentioned at the beginning that a, a large number of Juno youth have had to go to the outside resources for this. How many kids did you say were leaving a year for outside treatment like this? Uh, I think when they first did the Kids at Home, say, uh, Bring the Kids Home initiative, it was five to six hundred. It's down to about per year. Per year, okay. but those were those were for longer term residential type of needs. Um, today, I think it's down to about three hundred uh, youth having to leave for chemical dependency issues, rehabilitation. Uh, again, this is just going to fix a small part of that problem, which is detox. Well, I was curious about what the financial impact. Because if parents, if every child that needs inpatient services has to leave the city, what's the financial implications if now we have hundreds of kids that don't have to leave the city every year? Have, did you guys take that into consideration at all, or do you have any numbers about that? Alaska Airlines has probably done that analysis. But, <laughs> but no, we, we haven't. But it's what we've looked at. show that the, yeah. the positive impact we haven't taken our economic analysis that far and probably won't unless we feel like there's a need but uh, our primary um, thing that we have looked into is the anxiety level that is created for the youth that has to leave the financial hardship and we haven't documented it but we've talked you know anecdotally uh, the financial hardship that's created the emotional duress that's created the lack of the right environment uh, for healing the family uh, is the basic uh, unit that has to be treated that's around that patient. So it's not just that the patient um, that goes into this unit and voila, they come out better. There's group therapy rooms involved in this. A lot of times there are a lot of issues behind chemical dependency. This chemical dependency and behavioral disorders are interrelated a lot of times. The family has to be able to address and cope and participate in that healing process. And so the whole model breaks down from a quality of care standpoint when they have to leave. So um, have you had to go through or will you be going through a certificate of need process? And um, what do you anticipate your average length of stay would be? Average, average length of stay uh, will be uh, right around uh, 28 days. And yes, we will have to go through a certificate of need process. Uh, the folks at the state we have visited with, I, I just don't see the certificate of need being a big hold up. Sean, I, looking at that $10 million sales tax number on there, if, if you're gonna have 10 million of it uh, from reserves by the end of uh, fiscal 2012, and you're talking about probably a 2013 start date have you looked at maybe you know waiting or taking some more money out of reserves to, instead of that or maybe geo bond funding or what are your other alternatives there yeah the the um the hospital is faced with some major major expenditures so the reason we feel like we need to access the, the tax revenue or some other alternate sources of funding is because we're faced with a uh, the number is going up a little bit as we dig deeper uh, seven to eleven million dollars over the next four years going into our information system overhaul. Uh, the federal government has said that we have to have certain guidelines and standards met in terms of our IT system by 2013. Uh, so, you know, it's a massive, massive investment. Um, so we feel, like, and we feel like our bonding capacity, we're, we're you're, you're, you know more than I do about this, but we feel like uh, there's some excess bonding capacity. We could we could go out for bonding secured against, I guess, in sales tax revenue, but um, we, we're not quite sure that we're equipped to do that. So it sort of puts the project um, on hold at best and maybe uh, delayed or a no-go um, if we don't have some alternative sources of funding. But, Delayed, meaning probably five to 
seven years. Um, how did the, the board come about with, I mean, you have 10 million in reserves, so how did you make the board make the investment decision to go with uh, child mental health services as opposed to senior services, uh, dementia care, or when I was on the campaign trail, senior care, senior medical care was the number one issue among people, outweighed mental health of kids 10 to 1. And so that's kind of our hospital and you're investing our money in something that, is it the most highest need, medical need in the city? Or how did you come to that decision, the board? Well, we have expertise in behavioral health. We have bench strength in behavioral health. We are the provider of inpatient adult mental health for Southeast Alaska. So we try not to be all things to all people. We try to not get out of our realm of expertise. Uh, we're very focused and precise in our strategies. Uh, we try to not get strung out into areas we can't do it as well or better than the next guy. So that's really the, the thought process that went into that. John, I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning of some of the suicide prevention, I was a bit more involved than I have been. I'm, I'm pleased to see that there will be something for the people who need to get help, because the problem was people didn't know where to go to get any help at all. But my concern by blurring this with the detox, not all the kids we were losing back then were necessarily needing to go through detox. Are we maybe blurring the lines a little too much against the acute needs for intervention for the suicide? Good, good question. Um, behavioral health patients, 70% of them have co-occurring chemical dependency issues. Uh, that's an amazing figure. Uh, I really, you know, as we look, started looking, as I got here four years ago and started digging deeper into this, that was very surprising to me. So the two issues, very difficult to run an effective unit and separate those things, uh, it's, it, they're so intertwined. So we'll be able to do both the, the pure behavioral health with no chemical dependency issues, and we'll be able to do the detox. And in most, the, in most cases, we'll be handling behavioral health issues as well as the detox. I, I, I guess I, I should rephrase that. My concern is that you fill it up with detox kids, and we don't have a place for those families. That maybe it, it wasn't always necessarily not having the money to face these issues. They didn't have the resources. There was nowhere to go trying to find who do you call if you have a kid that's having issues. I mean, I haven't tracked the recent studies, but back when I was very vocal about this, we had lost eight or nine children in less than a year and a half. <coughs> Thank you. I understand your question better. Okay. That was taken into the needs okay. assessment and analysis. Okay. Thanks, Sean. I wanted to piggyback on uh, Max's question earlier about the, uh, not so much the reserves, because I understand that. Thank you. Uh, the other 23, or 13, rather, and I know there's, there's probably a complex uh, formula that you use, but when you determine how much you wanted to go toward sales tax and how much you might be able to get in state funding, how did you decide 10 for sales tax and 3 for state? Just doing an analysis of what was available and what was out there. I mean, the, the, there are no more federal funds. They're not coming. Um, um, the state, because it's a legislative priority, or at least the governor's priority, the suicide prevention, we felt like the state may be willing to kick something in. The mental health trust may have something available. But those seem a little bit more far-fetched than a revenue source that's already established. Um, which is the sales tax, particular sales tax, which is designated to specific projects. And, and I'm as anti-tax as just about anybody. Um, it's, it's our job to, to, to identify the need, try to find reasonable funding sources, make the ask. The assembly can say no, uh, the people can say no. And if they do, that's, you know, it's the people's tax money. I mean, it's, it's your money. So we will know at that point that you know we need to be reinvesting resources into things that may matter a little bit more um, to the to the community. So it's a it's a litmus test for us. Uh, it's a litmus test for the community just to know where you stand. Is it required to be a twenty three million dollar facility? Is it all the requirements that drive the cost up, or could you do a smaller scale facility with maybe an existing building 
but retrofit the building to accomplish these same needs. Save you a few million dollars here or there. Yeah, the construction um, requirements and codes for hospitals are outrageous. Uh, I know every industry probably feels more regulated than the next, but I've looked at some diagrams of, of uh, health care regulation and it's just outrageous. I've estimated we could cut 30% of our costs if all the regulations were just pulled away. So the code, the regulations around these buildings um, are intense and we feel like the only way to do it right uh, is to do it uh, sort of a, as a greenfield project. Question that's kind of out of your realm, but I'll ask it anyway. If what is the Alaska Mental Health Trust for, if not for something like this? It seems to me like this is that's where you should be trying for ten million dollars. Yeah, I I sort of thought that when I heard the name Mental Health Trust uh, four years ago. Um, <laughs> what I understand, and my again, I'm only a four-year Alaskan, so my my understanding is not anywhere close to what most of the people in this room have. But is that it's a, a trust that holds land? and they don't really sell the land. They, they may donate the land, to, but none of their land's on our hospital campus or uh, to provide those adjacencies that we would need. So I, I think maybe they, they, from what I understand, they do some smaller uh, contributions. They have their, their money in reserve from, from lands they've sold. They, they do have some cash, but uh, it's not a deep, deep pocket. The assembly can shoot me later, but a lot. <laughs> um, and, and so just to be completely transparent and leading, I as a taxpayer would vote to waive those for this project. Yeah, I, I have, um, I am so not politically correct. Um, we've gone through, mm, one of the first things I um, that just jumped out for me when I looked at our construction costs, because we were right in the middle of Project 2005 when I arrived, and we were getting ready to do the second piece of that, which was uh, an internal renovation. I looked at the model, because I had never seen a model uh, particularly like this one, and uh, I wanted to do construction management, which provides a bidding process, a guarant which we do have a bidding process, but it provides a guaranteed flat amount for the project. It's sort of a design build. They're involved heavily on the front end. They tell you exactly how much the project's going to cost and then they bear the risk if it goes over that dollar amount. It would require a change in city ordinance for us to be able to use the construction management model. Um, quite a lengthy, elaborate process from, from what I understand. So yeah, there's been a lot, been a lot of board discussion about that you know, three, four years ago, and the, the process is what it is. So, I've heard numbers as high as 40% of the last build-out was paid to the city in the form of permits and fees. I don't know if that number is accurate, but I'd be curious what percentage of that total build-out goes to the city. Um, you know, I'm not going to give you a percentage. I will uh, get the data, though on our last project and this project at a future date. I'm just afraid if I give you a number right now, it's not gonna be accurate. But it's significant and we'll be happy to show that to the community and plan on doing community presentations in the future. That, that would be good. I think the community would benefit from knowing what the city is basically pulling out of the project for city coffers, uh, for established departments and staff that will be there regardless of whether it's built or not. <laughs> Fair question. Uh, you, you didn't make me mad. <laughs> uh, any, anything else? Well, thank you, Sean.